the greatest commandment. This podcast is a study of Matthew 22:37. No knowledge of Accordance Bible software is necessary, or Greek, or Hebrew. Bible studies of familiar passages can often yield new and unexpected insights. Today, we'll take a look at what Jesus called the greatest commandment. Along the way, we'll trace the history of this commandment, consider the ways in which the Gospels were composed, and investigate a common figure of speech in the Bible. But when the Pharisees had heard he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The section of our focus is verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. We'll scroll up to target this verse in our info pane. Let's start by looking at the parallel passages in the synoptics and then compare their use of this citation from Deuteronomy 6.5. Let's take a look at the parallel passages in the other Gospels, which we can do by clicking this title in the info pane. We'll tie the scrolling, then use Add Text to display the Greek New Testament. Now, let's see how the other two synoptics render this passage. Mark also has heart. We'll highlight that word. And soul. We'll use Command 8 to reuse that same highlight. Here's mind. By the way, that's Alt-8 for those of you on PCs. But then this gospel adds strength. Luke, on the other hand, also has heart and soul. But then he writes strength and then mind. Let's put these in a table so we can compare them more easily. Matthew 22, 37 lists only three human attributes, while both of our parallel passages list four, although the order of the final two is different. All the passages begin with heart. They also all list soul next. They also all list mind, but the order is reversed in Luke. And finally, Mark, which many scholars believe was written before Matthew, and Luke, which many believe was written after, include strength although the word is missing from Matthew. So how do we explain these sorts of differences? There are five main theories of how the Gospels were composed. Each of them offers different reasons for these sorts of variations. First, the Gospel authors recorded the material exactly as they received it. Their interpretation only affected the way in which they arranged the individual pericopes. Second, the authors of each gospel chose the version of the particular saying or event that was most supportive of their overall message. Third, the gospel authors reshaped and adapted the sayings and events, reinterpreting them in the light of their literary audience's needs. Fourth, the differences occurred in the process of transmission, whether oral or written, before the stories reached each gospel author. And finally, the Gospels are free compositions, loosely based on what was remembered about Jesus' ministry after so many years. I should also add that there are people on both sides of the faith versus secular divide that hold to each of these positions. On the faith side of the divide, their differences are often linked to different understandings of inspiration. Was it limited to just Jesus himself? Or did it include the authors of the Gospels? Or, in some cases, was it also extended to the communities that preserved these traditions and passed them on? Where do I stand in this debate? Well, depending on the pericope, usually about here. I figured I might as well say so now, rather than try and answer all the emails I'll get asking me about it. Now, let's take a look at the original source of this commandment, Deuteronomy 6.5. It's part of the Shema, a passage recited morning and evening at the temple, and woven into Jewish life in some other ways as well, as we will see. Here's a snapshot of this verse, as it appears in texts that have been arranged in roughly chronological order. 
Modern English translations are based on the Hebrew Masoretic text, which in this case is identical with the Samaritan Pentateuch and the various scripture passages found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, the Aramaic Targums read a bit differently, as do several different versions of the Greek Septuagint. Let's return to our comparison. Here's Deuteronomy 6.5 in the Hebrew Bible, which lists three attributes, heart, soul, and strength. If we compare it to the other texts, we see that all of them also only have three attributes. Heart appears in the first position everywhere, except for a variant of the Septuagint which reads mine. That substitution, by the way, is typical of the Septuagint. Likewise, soul appears in the second position. The third attribute has the greatest variation. Notice that the Aramaic Targums substitute an Akkadian word which means possessions or perhaps money. Notice also that the Greek Septuagint's word for strength, dunamis, is a different word from the Gospels that have strength. So what's going on here? And how do we explain this variation? The simplest explanation is that this expression is a merism. Merism comes from the Greek merismos, a dividing, division, or a partition. It's a figure of speech in which something is described by enumerating several of its different traits or components. Merisms often indicate completeness. Examples of common merisms include hook, line, and sinker, high and low, good and evil, ladies and gentlemen, heart and soul, and flesh and bone. Notice that all of them describe the whole by listing its various parts. In short, all these authors were saying exactly the same thing in their various languages and to their respective cultures. Love God with your entire being. They just use different words, or combinations of words, to get the message across. The Shema, whose name is derived from the first word, hear, begins with a proclamation, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. After the exhortation to love God we've been studying, the passage concludes with instructions for teaching and remembering this passage. Of particular interest to us is this instruction, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. This verse gave rise to the use of phylacteries. Wayne Nunnally, in the Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible, describes them. A pair of small black leather boxes, Hebrew tefillin, containing parchment slips inscribed with biblical commandments. Although the command to bind them, the words of the Torah, as a sign on your hand and they shall be a frontlet on your forehead, Deuteronomy 6.8, was probably not originally intended to be taken literally, the Jews developed the practice of binding tefillin to their left arm and head. He concludes his article by saying, Rabbinic sources suggest that in the first century CE and before, it was customary for the observant to wear phylacteries all day. Today, laying tefillin occurs only during the morning prayers and weekday services. Notice that all of the passages contained in the phylacteries include this instruction, probably the reason they were chosen. Exodus 13, 1-16 is split into two parts, probably because of its length. The commandment is found here in the second part. It is found here in Deuteronomy 6, 4-9, the passage we've been studying, and again here in Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21. Let's see what sorts of images of phylacteries we can find. We'll choose the word, then right-click and choose Research and Graphic Tools. Notice the automatic search used English as the data field. We actually wanted picture captions, so let's make that change and run the search again. Here's a variety of images. First, from the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Then from one of our newest graphics tools, Todd Boland's Cultural Images of the Holy Land. Now, let's put all this together. The Pharisees asked Jesus what the greatest commandment is perhaps trying to trap him into saying that one was more important than another. He selects a commandment from the Shema, which was recited in the temple more than any other Old Testament passage. 
It was also one of four scriptures the Pharisees themselves bound between their eyes and on their forearms. So they were probably wearing them at the time of this confrontation. Jesus' commandment took the form of a merism, and while the exact parts enumerated had varied over the centuries, it exhorted the followers to love God with all their being. It was, in fact, a perfect summation of the law. History records that the chief error of the Pharisees was not their punctilious keeping of the external commandments of the law. It was their failure to accompany it with obedience to the law's internal demands. That command, to love God with all that we are and all that we have, remains the greatest of life's challenges. This has been Dr. J for Accordance Bible Software. Thank you for watching this episode of Lighting the Lamp.